Yeah, there's certainly, and I'm sure we'll probably get into that conversation as we talk about it and get into like the specifics of it. It definitely seems like this this content is a little bit more practical for data analysis. I feel like it. I mean, I guess, you know, I don't know. It seems um, super powerful too, but. Yeah. So I think with that, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll, we'll just, try, I guess we'll probably just get started for tonight. And so uh, Ryan has graciously taken on the um, presentation duties. We'll be discussing chapter number 17, which is the introduction to, or it's the, well, it's the introduction to metaprogramming. Uh, it talks about the big ideas around it. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Ryan. Yeah. Can everybody see, can everybody see my, uh, our program, my, my our studio session? Yes. I can see it. Okay, good. Um, all right. Well, uh, this is a, there's a lot of information, but it's not too deep. So I'll just kind of get through all of these kind of various utility, the usages and utilities of these um, various things. Uh, so I probably the big theme of this whole chapter or, you know, this whole section that we're about to read is this idea of code as data. So that means, you know, being able to, um, in a circular fashion, you know, write something, have something happen, and then have that thing that you wrote modified as a function of perhaps things that happen after or, you know, that are unique uh, to a, a certain context. We also learn about tree-like structures, ASTs. Um, we learn the, the idea that you can create expressions programmatically, which kind of is what I was just referring to. Um, how to execute expressions by a value in an environment. So this is um, relating to this thing called that, um, well, uh, as I'll talk about it in a second, data masks, which I had never even heard of this before, to be honest. I'd heard of closures and I had heard of, you know, a bunch of things, you know, abstract trees and all this stuff, but I had never heard of data masking before this. It was kind of interesting. How to um, customize this evaluation. Um, in, in by modifying or, or, or supplying custom functions. And then, like I said, um, the last two things, data uh, masks, so blur the line between environments and data frames and closures. This is a tool for um, you know, where we kind of take information what, in which environment. Um, so, so the first one, um, to be, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but I always thought that the Rlang package was just like part of base R. You know what I mean? Like I never really understood. I didn't realize this was like a newfangled thing. Um, so anyway, like uh, I don't know if anyone else has like looked on this page, but um, the Arlang page has tons of um, good stuff. I don't know if anyone else has had a chance. Um, I mean, I know we all have enough to, to read as it were, but um, yeah, this was helpful to, to me. Um, yeah, so like how to diffuse an R expression. Once again, my favorite word of the day is diffuse. Um, when a piece of code is diffused, it doesn't return its value. Instead, it returns an expression and a special tree-like object that describes how to compute that value. So um, they're blueprints or, or recipes um, for you know computing values, but we're not doing anything right now. So um, this expr uh, function takes you know anything you put in there and just returns it. Um, we can also save it as um, a variable, but um, this uh, evaluation thing is um, part of the, the, a second issue that we have to solve, which um, we, we solve with, um, how are people pronouncing this? Is it EN Express or how, how are y'all saying this out of curiosity? I just say, I'm just saying I yeah, I've just been saying an expression, but an expression, okay. I, I am not a an authority on the of what it's actually called. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never um, had to say it out loud. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'll just say an expression. That's fine. <clears throat> um so yeah, this isn't what we want, right? We don't we, we want you know this to come back um as a um as, as the expression. So yeah, so you need a different tool to capture code passed to a function because Express doesn't work. So we, we, you know, in the book, they create this function called capture it. Um, we just use expression and 
when we enter an expression into our new thing, we just get the X that is in there. So we need to have this so that we can quote the first argument, right? So, and um, as I'll talk about in a second, the first argument is always what? Does anybody remember? When it was first from something like this? It's always the, the function itself, right? If it's so, if the function is just an f or a g or whatever, um, that's the first thing that goes into this. So it's quoting that that makes an expression work, right? So um, because we're just we're saying, hey, that first argument is, you know, it's it's not functional as it were. Um, so yeah, so the first argument of the call is the function to be called, which means the first argument is the second position. Right, so um, so here's an example. So AST comes from the lobster. I think I'm pronouncing that lobster. I don't know if anyone else has had a different, but I always feel like if you're gonna put a, a capital R in something, you gotta like lean into it. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's how I'm doing it. You know, it's like deploy R. I always say deploy R. I don't know if anyone else is. Maybe I'm just crazy, but yeah. Anyway, the point is, is uh, we have an expression that actually has a function which is the plus sign and then two things you know two other things i found a really great i don't know if people are interested um put this in the chat but um i don't know if people feel about medium anymore but it's a good article that just kind of introduced that a little bit um so uh, well we can use um, ast to understand um complex this is from that article by the way sorry to understand complex expressions, it can be handy for another trivial yet confusing operation, operation precedence, which book doesn't, this is from the article, right? This isn't from, you know, the book, but the most common use case for diffusing expressions is to resume its evaluation in a data mask. Um, I'll get more into this later. This makes it possible for the expression to refer to the columns of the data from as if they were regular objects, which as we'll learn in a second, we, we do this all the time when we use dplyr or, or dplyr or, or, or tidyverse or whatever, right? We're already kind of doing that because we're not saying data frame, dollar sign, variable name, right? But, um, oh yeah, so this this express, this is once again from the article. Um, so we, imagine we have this, and by the way, I'm not even necessarily sure I agree with this. So this is, you know, from the article, the expression why you know blah 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 is difficult to do manually, um, even though it contains simple. This is because it's not easy to use operator precedents in our minds. So, what we can do is plug this in. I don't really know how that's. I guess so. I guess what we're saying is is the, um, addition is more. Um, uh, takes precedence over divide. I, I don't know, but that's not correct, right? I mean, that, so I don't, I don't, I don't no, know. No, you, you see the way around, but it is doing that. Yeah. The tightly bind, the more tightly binding things should be way lower, deeper in the tree in which they are. Oh, okay. Right? So, right? Yeah. so five, three times five happens way down here in the tree. Right. For example. Yeah, I years. haven't thought about order of operations since I was a lot younger. So um, forgive me if I, I screw that. But yeah, no, so I guess you're right. So this goes first and then this sort of goes from the bottom up. Is what yeah. Saying, right. So anyway, I, I, I guess that's kind of interesting, right? So maybe if you're like, you're not sure if like a, a formula that you wrote is like, or, you know, is working, maybe you can check the the sort of the ordering via AST, right? Um, so that's what, Sorry, I just yeah. want like one question about this though, about this uh, this idea of um, like precedence or object precedence. I think it was the term that that was being mentioned. Mm -hmm. That has to be explicitly defined in the language, right? Like there's certain like things that there's just like certain things that like outside in the real world they can be modeled any way, but mm -hmm. as the designers of the language. Right. They need for the grammar of it. They need to say yeah, it's like, in the grammar. Exactly. These are the rules. Like these are the rules this language follows. Right. And so like Hadley brings up this one, and I think this might be in a later chapter, but he brings up like PEMDAS, you know, parentheses, explanation, exponentiation, whatever. It's because those rules are just yeah taught to us over and over again. But there's other situations where that's not as clear, and I think it talks about one with like assignment and like white space and stuff like that like where like if you like I, I can't remember so like it has to you have to have something explicitly spelt within the underlying grammar to say like 
this is how the precedence happens. Like in this mm. case, this is what happens. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so you're to your point. I mean, we shouldn't even need this uh, this um, this tree to to tell what the woman I mean, we should know. But if, I guess yeah, this it was just an illustration as a way of kind of just showing like what order in which this. But yeah, no, it's I I, I hear you about PEMDAS. I hadn't thought about PEMDAS in a long time. Goodness. Um, well, well, I think it's important though. I think it's important. It is. Because there are certain situations like this tree is important, you know, mm -hmm. because there are certain situations where you the rules are gray. You can choose mm -hmm. either option, but the people who design the language, they have to decide this is the grammar that we have to follow for this to work. And so yeah. that's where the AST comes in is figuring out the grammar of the language. So, yeah. Great, great point. <laughs> um yeah, so this whole idea of generating code, this this is new to me. I have used the bang bang operator, but not the call to. So apparently in our line, we can use this function called call to, where um, we put um, a function to call and then the arguments in it. So in this, but it doesn't actually um, evaluate them. It just sort of creates the expression, right? At least, at least that's how, how I'm reading it. But made some kind of comments about how um you know this is this is not really good for doing interactive work so instead we should do this idea of the bang bang operator um i'm not really sure how um this is so much better i don't know i'm just kind of curious actually this is kind of interesting to me i don't, I don't know the call to thing but anyway i guess bang bang is sort of like something people are using more so um what it does is takes the expression and it's um, you know fills fills them out not just the actual um, symbols but also the parentheses right which apparently is super important because of the issue that we were just talking about the operator precedence right we didn't if it didn't include that we would have to I guess find a way to like explicitly include the parentheses otherwise we would have um, uh i guess yeah sorry this is on multiple lines but yeah if we didn't have those this is what we would get right as opposed to this in terms of how it would be evaluated does that make sense to everybody um yeah oh yeah and then um they talk about um this was an example in the book too that i thought was sort of interesting right so um you know we have a function where we uh, we want to create, you know, an expression and then uh, kind of do other stuff with it. But um, this doesn't actually do any kind of evaluation. It's just so I just put this in here as an example. This is obviously not something we would want to like, put into a function. So when we do that, all it does is just actually include, you know, that that. Um, import the, the argument into the thing it doesn't do any kind of um, evaluation we need the, the you know the eval function and other stuff i guess as it were so uh any questions so far so so far you know all of this sort of bang bang eval uh, uh, expression and expression is all about taking stuff that we um, create and making them you know, sort of in memory, you know, so it's not just dead information, right? So that we can actually make, you know, do other things with these expressions that perhaps go beyond what, what our initial sort of expectations or, or desires were. Um, so then after we create all these, the code, uh, we can do evaluations and there's two pieces to this eval function, which is an expression and then an environment. So you'll see here expression, um, this and so um I'm, I'm giving it this you know this function to, to fulfill um that until i say eval isn't going to get expressed right so if i were just to put um this i would just get um uh a x plus y and then um and then, so in this environment these are the, the values of those two symbols right so in this case you know it would be um 11 but we can also choose other environments, right? We could have told it, you know, hey, um, you know, look in the environment, you know, where, you know, we're already working or whatever. So 
Um, yeah, so a couple of things that I liked about the chapter. So one of the big advantages of valuing code manually is that you can tweak the environment. Um, um, there are two main reasons. Temporary override functions to implement a domain specific language. I'm trying to think of this. Have any of you ever like done something like this in an analysis where you actually wanted to override like the default behavior of a function? I couldn't think of an example. This one was this this idea was a little abstract. Like I understood the example, like mm -hmm. dplyr has or dplyr, however we want to pronounce it. Right. Um, it it has some functionality built into it that if you are connecting to a SQL database, that it can translate your mm -hmm. analysis steps into SQL syntax, which gets passed into through your connection into SQL, and so. Right. That's where I got a little confused about this. Yeah. Because I would, and, and now that I'm talking through it, I think it's just like the package might have like an environment object that in those function definitions of like, you know, like a group by summarize or something like that, it defines the group by summarizing using SQL syntax in the environment so that it's smart enough mm. to know that if it's passing. A, like a like a SQL connection or something, and again, I don't know the internals of it. I'm just kind of spitballing. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. It would just translate it into SQL syntax for you. Sure, is the way I'm kind of understanding. That's what I got out of that too. Yeah, no, that I makes got, sense. In yeah. fact, I love the dplyr SQL. You know, I, I saw, that was a great example in the book. Um, yeah, I guess I was just like thinking of like something where like, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess then they do like actually mention you know some. I guess. I guess maybe I'm I'm, I'm overly enriched. I'm, there's too I'm too enriched in my like interpretation of what they mean by override, right? Like you're not trying to make the functions do completely different things. You're just you know you're just changing it a little bit in terms of how they get evaluated or something like that. And then um, another favorite word of the week is data mass. So you have can refer to add a data mass. So you can refer to variables in a data frame as if they were variables in environment. So I probably actually have to say if there's like one thing that like made me fall in love with the tidyverse it's probably this you know if you really think about it not, i mean i love the pipes and i love kind of having everything like in you know kind of in sequences but yeah i i think we take this for granted you know we don't you know by you know by using pipes and by using you know this data mask idea we can kind of work flexibly within in the context of a data frame um but um yeah you know, and so it, 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 I guess they talk about the downside is the sort of idea of ambiguity can be problematic because, you know, you know, it's not, you're not always clear, like what you know, environment you're talking about, which is one of the reasons why these, this environment idea is so important. Right. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have much to say for this, this, you know, part of the chapter of customizing evaluation of the functions. So, um, you know, there's, you know, th different things, um, you know, that we can do where we can feed, you know, different expressions into to, to functions. Um, and then uh, also we can use data. So um, modifying evaluations to look for data in a, in a data frame instead of an environment. So, yeah, I mean, this kind of goes to what we were all just kind of talking about, this idea of base um, subset and transform. And then um, the AES function in, in, in ggplot2 and um, the mutate function, these are all um you know things where you know we don't have to you know because of this whole idea of the data mask you know we don't have to refer to the data frame it's sort of implicit in you know the the the, the syntax for us to kind of figure out you know where we go from you know top to bottom so uh we also talk about the the, the eval underscore tidy um, um function which also is a data mask so we have a data frame here um that we want to um evaluate for each because there's you know multiple there's there's five rows it just keeps getting um read off until um and obviously i didn't set my seed so this will be different every single time but um yeah so this it doesn't want it goes through all five rows that's interesting so it's i guess you could say it's a vectorized function that's, a, that's another thing that we, we, we you know, kind of take for granted with some R stuff where it's going through each row of the, the data frame. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so anyway, this was another thing I kind of took from the book where evaluating the data mask is a useful technique um, for interactive analysis because it allows you to write X plus Y rather than, 
you know, D, F, you know, um, select X, you know, whatever. I guess I'm not even sure what we what kind of uh, symbol we would give for the, um, or what kind of, how, how do we refer to the um, the dollar sign? We don't say dollar sign, right? Is there is there like a, a term for that function or that? Good question. I wonder what it is too. <laughs> Yeah. I've always I've always referred to it as dollar sign notation, but yeah, I would, is it just a subsetting operator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's an, it's an interesting um, you know point. Um, anyway, it isn't it's not really that important? Um, yeah. So anyway, this was uh, yeah another thing as a as a tidy. I'm not sure. Actually, I took this from. This was from the, the uh, our language. As a tidyverse user, you will rarely need to diffuse expressions manually with expression, and even more rarely to resume evaluation with um, eval or, or eval tidy. Instead, you call ma data masking functions, which take care of diffusing your arguments and resuming them, resuming them in the context of a data mask. So, yeah, I thought that was sort of interesting, right? This idea of um, yeah, there's all these great articles, by the way, like, so what is data masking? Why do you need this, right? So that's another thing that doesn't even get, I think we're going to be talking about this more, um, this idea of, um, well, we're going to talk about quasi-quotation and injection and all that stuff. But yeah, this I, I, I this was a great read. Um, yeah, so when, you know, just to say summarize, mean um, by, you um, um, cylinder or whatever, like this is diffused in data masks, right? Because we're not referring to empty cars again. And um, that's it. Um, I just want to point out that your computer says it's 39 degrees Fahrenheit and windy. Mine says 85 and sunny. <laughs> well, welcome to Cleveland, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of lower left. Yeah. This is, um, this is well, the unfortunate side effects of living in the Middle West. <laughs> Today is a journey. Um, oh yeah, so so th this idea of the the embrace, I guess you know, the embrace operator, which is just double um, parentheses. Actually, yeah, so double um, uh, parentheses. Uh, yeah, so like in this case, my, my mean. So if you wanted to evaluate this, you have to tell it specifically, which I have done that before. I didn't fully understand why I was doing that, if I'm being completely honest. But um, yeah, so this this allows you to, um, this embrace operator allows you to diffuse the correct expression. Right? And then lastly, closures. I'm gonna be honest, again, I have heard this term so much um, and I got so, um, well, I'll, I'll use good family language here. Um, mad that you know, I got I couldn't understand like what this meant, and I couldn't understand what tidy evaluation was about. And um, I'm still a little bit kind of uncertain, but yeah, like this idea of you know where you go in the in 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 your environments to find information. So if I were to, let's say we have this function called with two, where we have a data frame and an expression. Um, you know, we, we plug all our stuff in. And then um, remember that a is, is worth a thousand and within the, the function itself. But uh, and when we redefine redefine uh, a is equal to ten outside of the function environment, it doesn't matter because a is still called, it's still labeled, it, or it's still valued at a thousand because that's you know where we're looking to do this stuff, right? We have um, yeah, so closures. Um, allows you to bundle an expression with an environment. So you get to be more sort of like, um, I guess, sort of specific about where you want it to go. So you're saying, hey, repeat that thing, um, you know, from before, but uh, make sure that you, um, oh yeah, I know why, it's just because we, we we did this thing called end quote, right? So, um, and is, it, is anyone else pronounce that weird? I, I just call it end quote. I, I guess that's you know whatever. Sounds right to me. So instead of saying an expression, express um, expression, we're saying end quote. So that allows us to um, um, sort of just evaluate the expression within the context of this other environment, right? So specifying the data frame as as a way of saying, hey, this is you know. 
what we want to do. So even though um, a thousand is was what a is worth, then the 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 function environment that's not what we see when we use this language here. So yeah. Uh, so anyway, one of the last things they said was whenever you use a data mask, you, must all, you should always use, this was actually informative. I'm going to try to write a function actually where I use this and this this week. So um, you must always use end quote instead of um, an expression. Um, but yeah, I um, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get more into this later. But yeah, one of the things I did like was this idea of patterns, right? So depending on um, what, what what behavior does the wrap function implement, what behavior should your function implement? I like this. This was sort of interesting. I, I kind of wanted to get into more of this this week, but um, we will see. But that's all I got. Um, any um, questions or things? I, I do like this idea. I, I was be, to be really clear, like I like this idea of kind of you know making things explicit about environments. I'm still kind of the idea of environment is still weird to me because to me it's just like well it's whatever's in my R session you know what i mean i'm not trying to separate environment so much but i, I see the wisdom of this more where hey you know maybe we for whatever reason you you don't want to refer to something that's in one environment you want to do it in another i don't know but it seems inter wildly interesting to me to kind of start thinking about that so um yeah sorry maybe that was too fast but yeah that was um yeah, that oh, was good. Yeah, it was. Um, I think I think this is going to be like probably I'm I'm going to enjoy this part of the book more than, um, and you know, sort of object oriented stuff just because, well, I can kind of understand why we would do this stuff more. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, um, have any of you guys ever used like this idea of diffused? Uh, expressions in a function before in your work out of curiosity or is this like all still new i mean obviously we wouldn't be here if we knew about this stuff i guess at a great level but has anyone ever use, use this stuff no yeah <laughs> good i mean yeah. i think i've i think i've more abused like the use of the curly the double curly braces and yeah uh, the bang bang operator i think it's interesting the, so the double curly braces is um i was just looking at that right now it's like what the heck i'd ever heard of that and uh and it's not he doesn't actually cover it in this book so i wonder if it's a newer thing um oh it's not covered in the book at all no it's, i guess under the hood it's a combination of an in quo and a double at bang double exclamation oh, point see. which are covered so i think it's a shorthand it's a basically a shorthand a little syntactic sugar but um it's not actually covered directly yeah. as far as i got my i just did a search and i couldn't find it. i could find bang bang and the rest but yeah. yeah actually i'm looking at uh, there's a there's a there's a whole page on diffuse argument function arguments and yeah there is this um diffuse uh, it says something about these are advanced tools make sure to first learn about the embrace operator um the embrace operator is easier to learn with less serian is sufficient in most applications so that's actually interesting right by the way i'll, I'll, I'll sorry i should probably put this into the chat um but yeah there is, I don't know if I don't know if the group saw, but um John the Geek is organizing oh yeah a read through of the the entire Arlang. all of our lang. And so it's yeah. it's a good opportunity because it sounds like it sounds like our lang is kind of at the foundation of all of this metaprogramming stuff, at least with the tidyverse stuff. So I know that they were doing that with Dplyr, I think, as well. They're going through like every single thing. I I, I totally want to do this. But I, I can, barely, as you guys know, I can barely keep up with the stuff that I'm doing. So I'm not even going to like entertain that for now. But um, same, yeah. But uh, God, I do want to go. I do want to like learn more about this. But yeah, no, this is definitely like the computer science um, sort of stuff. Like I never got this right. By the way, it's so like when, whenever we use the R lang package and stuff like that and we do all this diffusion we're doing non-standard evaluation is that right is that is that because i always i always get confused by this anytime i'm not doing like data frame dollar sign x that that's standard evaluation yes but like anytime we do this sort of expression and expression all that stuff that's so that we yeah. can stuff like tidyverse that's non-standard evaluation well sure are you in a mutate when you write y equals you know x plus something else 
it's not evaluating that right away because none of those variables are defined. So it's doing something non-standard to evaluate in the context with that with your data frame, right? We're just so used to it. We, we think it was kind of standard now, but. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, we confused the heck out of me when I first started using R because there's a lot of that in R as opposed to like Python. Although Python's starting to like embrace some of that idea now. Yeah. But it's I, for, I don't, but I don't I don't know if you guys remember this, but like so tidy evaluation came out like in 2018 or I forget what it was, but they started talking about it like in 18 or 19 or seven, maybe it's back. Is it that years. young? Huh? Yeah, I think it's pretty young. So I remember uh, if I ever find the video. So like for the R comp for whatever, like the R studio comp or something like that, like Hadley went up and like one of his like sort of like R studio year kind of like in summary was like, I guess he felt like the tidy um eval was too complicated people were like really kind of pushing back or that was my I, i'll if i ever find that I'll, I'll have to okay but yeah i mean i think you know it's still moving forward i think there's still but i think it was like i think his in his eyes everybody would just be doing all this end quo and you know and expression stuff and like it would all make sense but i think you know for a lot of people like well i mean at least for myself i can say it was it was um challenging but um yeah well it it was at least from my perspective it was like three four years ago this was all just like it was mm -hmm. kind of like it was just a mess because i don't say it was a mess but it was just it was hard to understand because you had to you had to understand these metaprogramming principles to program with dplyr you know you mm -hmm. know dplyr ggplot mm -hmm. to get it to program with it to put them into functions and so like it goes back to like the design of like the tidyverse which was for interactive analysis but then people are like, oh man, these tools are great. We would like to abstract them out into functions. But because of the data masking issue, it was hard, you know? And so they had to do the tidy evaluation, which brought in the end quo, the bang, bang, the triple bang, bang, the walrus. Like there was the all walrus. kinds of, <laughs> there's so yeah. many operators that I was just like, I think the walrus is still around, but it's like it's. Oh, that's the one with like the 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 equals and the yeah no it's it's around it's it's used in um God, I can't remember now but I do know that it's used in in something that is so funny no I I remember going on like Stack Overflow and people started talking about this stuff like a couple years ago I'm like what are they talking about I was like what is this end quote stuff what is this what is this um you know I was I didn't realize actually probably the, one of the best things for me the learning is this all just comes from our language. I, like once again i didn't fully understand like what that meant and you know like what's you know how it was related to you know um you know the kind of the, the the overall syntax of the language right um actually i don't know if anyone else this is probably the thing that like i spend most of my time i, I wouldn't say I should say, a majority of my time doing this which i just shared which is how do i take multiple columns to do something right like whether it's you yep. Know, is, you know that so, I do have problems. Yeah. yeah, I have to keep looking. Especially at doing it. I used to do observational research, which means like you know I've got all of these variables in this data set that I'm trying to you know do stuff with, and you know I want to do a bunch of stuff, um, you know, sort of all at once, right? So, um, you know, obviously things like group by are important, but um, this idea of tidy selection, and people have really dealt with that before, but like you, where you can. Um, you know, you can make some kind of like, you know, select, oh, if, they, if it starts with these letters or if it ends with these letters or if it, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. The, so I actually am I, probably if there's like one thing I'm most stoked about so far, it's it's this where like I, I kind of understand like what this is about a little bit. I mean, I still have a ways to go, but yeah, I kind of understand like where it's coming from, like why we're doing it maybe. Um, so, but um same plots different data you know like yeah that kind of stuff too is something that i run across a lot um something that i recently ran across was like if you're trying to if you're trying to use like tidyverse stuff with um other packages that use expressions like um i've used the survey package before so for survey data and yeah. that uses expressions. So it uses, I think it uses expressions to determine like if you want to create like contingency tables and stuff. And I was like, I would love to do this for multiple things. Let's put this into a function. And then you run into this issue of like metaprogramming where, you know, it's it's quoted, not quoted. And yeah, it it 
definitely is directly applicable to the stuff I do too. But yeah, that is actually it's, it's it's funny like too like this idea of like whether or not arguments are quoted or not like that's something that's like it's a little bit like English, you know what I mean? Like where you know there's something you know logically it seems like it should be quoted but it's not or vice versa. You know, it's like um, I, I find, but it, but, it, but it's it's how well they incorporate all this this stuff, right? This you know this this sort of expression stuff, right? Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think know, I stared at that page. I finally understand kind of what the heck that embrace operator does now. It was about like fifty times in the past I could have used that. I did some horrendous work around. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but I know. Um, but, well, like like we said three years ago, it used to be just like a it just used to be a mismatch of do I use in quo here? Okay, I use in quo first, and then I use the bang bang, and then I think there was like a triple bang bang, like a three like the three exclamation point, and then like if you were it, it just was like it made no sense, like and I it made sense if you understood base, you understand know, metaprogramming, but like sometimes as a data analyst or something you're working with data, you think of you think of the variable as a variable in your data, not a variable yeah. in your environment. And so yeah. it's it's that, it's this unfortunate use of the term just in two different contexts mm. that is very confusing. And actually Hadley has a vignette that talks about that idea. I think it's in, I think it's in the shiny book, this idea of like, there's a difference between like an environment variable versus a variable in your data. And then that gets mismatched between, you know, that gets like mixed up when you're trying to program. I don't think it, I, I'll be honest with you. My opinion, I think none of this stuff ever gets super easy. It's just, it's hard to think about in some ways. I've had some experience with it with, with mathematics, which I've used for a long, long time. And it has this concept of like hold and evaluate. And sometimes it's confusing. Like, well, I got a hold inside of a hold or something. I don't know how many levels deep is this. And how do I get this thing evaluated that's deep down in there? It's, it gets a little bit, um, Sometimes you just have to like experiment. <laughs> you just think, I'll try this. I'll try that. Okay. It worked. I don't understand it, but I want to paste it in there. Yeah, that type of thing. Well, it's like, it's just like working with other interfaces too. You know, like different interfaces use this idea of quoting, unquoting expressions, non expressions differently. And so when you're trying to like use different packages that use like a different way to use a different approach to this meta programming, it's, like you, like you said, Ron, you have to like dig into like, yeah. okay, I like the amount of times that I've had to like create a function where I'm dealing with this, like I have to dump a browser in it to see like what that, what these objects are. And then like this experiment with unquo, quo, whatever, to see if it actually is like the, what I want it to be. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of like really well uh, famous, like sort of non-tidy packages. I don't know if um anyone's ever used the psych package before anyone familiar with that yeah i have so it's made by a psychology professor at northwestern a guy named william revel who's really famous and th that package is a, is a lifesaver but it's like the way that all of the the, the the programming works if you ever try to do stuff in it it's a mess it's like because it's not like tidy because we're so we're so spoiled by all mm -hmm. of this this stuff for sure. So actually one of the things some people have been doing is creating like kind of tidy versions of, you know, um, the same functions that the psych package does like for factor analysis and whatnot, but yeah. Survey um, package is the same. It's the oh, same right? thing. It's one of those packages that have been just around for like forever, but it like is so convenient to use, but then it's just one of those things like where you want to program with it. Then it's just like, then it's like, dang, this is a pain. <laughs> Yeah, I've never used that survey pack, or at least I don't. Um, trying to see, like, um, oh, okay, so it's like an epi aside from the epidemia. I think one of the things that's really key is like, you know, who is who created this? You know what I mean? Like, what what field? You know, because that helps sometimes. Okay. Yeah, yes. no, it's interesting. It's by Thomas Lumley. Like Lumley, yeah, I know that name. It's been around for a long. I think it's been around for a long time, but like, yeah, yeah. it's. It, yeah. I mean, it's it's a very convenient package, but like I said, like when you start trying to like do tidy tidy value, when you try to do some of this meta programming stuff with it, it gets hard because you have to know the you have to know how the objects are represented in that package. And yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm I'll, I'll, you know, I'm bookmarking this. This is do you use 
Have you tried that survey SRVYR package? It's supposed to try to tidy up the survey package. I am re not. Are removing vowels, I guess, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I've just I've just used the survey package in the past because I I kind of understand how it applies, like sampling weights and stuff. But I'm sure like the survey package does it as well. Um, I just haven't I learned it yet. Yeah. Survey. Yeah. There's some text to survey analysis. Yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah. Oh, it does have a weights. So, oh, that's kind of nice. Uh, there's a better page actually than that. This is probably the, their official page. Well, that's kind of nice. I might have to translate some of my stuff over here. <laughs> I know. Oh, this actually looks a lot nicer. <laughs> okay. And what's it called again? Sorry. What what survey? Survey R. With no vowels. Shared. <laughs> I oh, shared I in the in the chat. The first one from survey. that. Yeah. Oh yeah, survey R. Right. Yeah. Survey survey R. Survey R. Yeah. You gotta know where to put the emphasis, man. Yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> They didn't, um, even use the, they didn't use the hexagon. I guess you can't use the hexagon unless you're part of the official tidyverse. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's also by Lumley, too. He's one of the authors. Mm, that's cool. Yeah. It looks like this is just like a wrapper around, yeah. which it's just, it's just translating it into. That's kind of neat. Huh, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Well, let's see. I don't think there's, unless there's anything else. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I think that's pretty much. Um, so for next week, we're going to cover expressions. Uh, I don't have any being listed there, but I mean, I'm happy to jump in and take it if nobody um, wants to take it. I mean, it defaults if, to me anyways. If nobody, if takes you want to take that one, I could slide into quasi quotation slide. I just can't do next week, but I could do. Hold on. Yeah. I'm trying to see, like, I'm trying to see here. Um, okay, so actually, I was just looking. We're, we're not that far. Well, I mean, I, I should say we're not that close to the end, but we're, so that we, have, we have basically, like, after next week, we have four other chapters to make kind of, to do. Um, yeah, if you do yeah. expression, I'll do, I'll do um, evaluation. Okay, well, I could take expressions if Ron, if you want to take quasi quotation. Sure, unless Stone wants to jump in. He's... Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't have Stone. If you wanted to, mm -hmm. we need we, we need somebody for chapter twenty one. If you want to do Stone, let me pull this up. It's up to y'all. I can move to expressions. At least we have next week covered. And if if you yeah. want to look at what All you right. want to do, um. You know, yeah, <laughs> we say we're almost done, but All right, yeah, I'll jump I've, in I've, quasi. Again, I've read, someone wants to jump in. June down. is a long time from now. We yeah, wish I didn't do much of the meta programming stuff just because uh, I actually don't use tidyverse at all. So a oh, lot of this stuff. No, I use basically zero tidyverse. It's all base R and like RCPP. Because you're old school, man. Like um, in RCP, RCPP though. Yeah, yeah, a little that's, that's tiny, so tiny bit. Huh. Yeah. Um, mainly for a lot of the same issues you guys are talking about, where it's like hard to figure out how to program with it. Is, um, so just a lot yeah. of ton of base R stuff. Uh, cool. So yeah, I never, yeah. So I went to school at University of Auckland. Um, really? Where, yeah, where our core is. Um, so they're very big on base R, and there's like no classes that teach Tidyverse basically at the postgraduate level. Yeah, yeah so there's like a they're, group they're of turning their back there. on Hadley. They're the the, the 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 great. I mean, like that's his that's his invention, isn't it? Or I don't know. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was from Auckland, but um, yeah, yeah it's mostly it's just because it's true. Yeah, actually. Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Stone. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I, th I think it's just that because a lot of the professors there are our core members, so they just like teach base R mainly. Um, it's actually I think really it's changing slightly. They'll do, like do both like base R and Tidyverse in some of their like first or second year classes, but yeah, very, very little Tidyverse when I was there. Man. Hmm. I know I've seen like people on Twitter posting things like they don't ever use Tidyverse and they prefer base R and I don't know if they're just like 
curmudgeons or <laughs> there's a guy there's a stats professor I, I went to uc davis university of california davis my phd and this is way before i ever started using r but there was a there's a stats professor old step norman um matt matt loff matt loff yeah. yeah dude he you want to talk about the origin he is hardcore <laughs> no apologies <laughs> <laughs> Screw the tidy verse. Just go back to whatever the old school is. I mean, I don't know, I agree with him, but it's like, you know, he's, he, he's for me, a lot of it is like I can do most of the stuff in base R and it takes a little longer, but if I ever need to like modify any code, I just don't have to deal with any metaprogramming at all. It's just more base R. So hmm. it simplifies a lot of things like that there there is then, that i guess i've also heard people say that base r is more stable so like if you especially if you're writing something that's going to be around for a long time you use a lot of tidyverse stuff and come back five years later ryan you've mentioned this before right you come back and like well none of this stuff works anymore because they've changed well, it everything. works you just gotta tweak it yeah or you get an old loaded old version or something yeah but maybe norman has maybe he's the right one maybe we're <laughs> yeah. um I don't know, man. I, I, I'll tell you this. The closest I've ever come to like leaving tidy versus uh, so tidy. I don't know if you know this. Dplyr is like super slow compared to the um, is it the DT pack. Is it DT? That's the one that's just like super fast because it's based on like C code or something like that. Oh, uh, data table. Yeah. Data table. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Data table. Yeah. Data. Dot, yeah. Yeah. I always say data dot table, which once again, I have weird pronunciation issues. Um, but I tried to do that and it was like, I felt so, like I was learning this foreign language. I just couldn't handle it. So yeah, there's actually like a wrapper you can do. It's called DT plier, which basically oh. like, you just wrap your, 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 your D plier code in this like wrapper that will translate it to D, um, to a data table. And oh, you're saying using data tables versus using tibbles basically. Well, no, no. Yeah. So like, no, so data table is a, is a, is a D plier, um, package like like package it's it's whole, it's oh. whole yeah so sorry so there's data tables like i guess that's a type of data you know like a data structure no this is a package called data table and the guy who invented it like it's way yeah, faster yeah. it's way faster than dplyr and i i know this because I, I used to have things like where like i would have like uh, you know oh i see file with mean. like a million rows in it you know what i mean or like five million rows i mean imagine trying to you know so it would take 18 hours to run dplyr and um, yeah, so then I, I tried to do the data table thing and it would be like only, you know, half as long or something like that. It was still a long time, but That's yeah, tremendous. people who are like, people who are like working with huge, huge data sets, you know, and, and, and their own memory or whatever, they're, they're probably not using dplyr, you know? So that's interesting, man, about Auckland. I kind of want to like go down there now and be like, I want to just receive the base wisdom and just be like, okay. Cause it, you know, it is true. That, like we try to solve too many problems with packages, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, as a consumer, I'm like, Oh, this guy made this really cool package. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, a lot of times it's, that is super useful, but to, to be able to kind of do stuff at like soup to nuts level would be kind of like, you know, cool. I don't know, but that kind of, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I will. Ne I will never probably be fully just like. I will never probably be used to them, but I. I do love the fact that you do that. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's a point. It's probably good to learn tidyverse. I just haven't really had the time, like um, mm -hmm. ggplot two and stuff. But yeah, same yeah. with like learning data data table syntax because that is a different syntax as well oh, from base R. It, it has the walrus. It uses the walrus. Yeah. Still. Yeah, and it's okay. just. So it's like at some point it's <laughs> pick one of the many flavors of R and just honestly I'm just like stick, stick with one flavor. Yeah, really no, that's, well. that's really right. I mean that's right. I mean it's like see it's a little bit like it really is like a language where like you know dude you're not gonna like get everything so yeah get get the the dialect that makes the most sense that's the most functional and the most productive for you. Yeah, but um, yeah, man, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely a uh, double down on what you know. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. If there finally is a hole, then then go learn it. But um, yeah. But so next week um, is Colin, and then um, and then it's yeah. Ron or me. So yeah, I'll I'll. I got it. I signed up. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, at least we got next week covered. I can cover expressions. Um, yeah, it's these chapters are going to be a little bit longer. So, yeah, we'll so see. if you feel like, yeah, if you need to stretch it out, let us know.
Yeah. yeah. It it may. It depends. I mean, I don't, I've kind of read through expressions already, but like getting into quasi quotation and evaluation, those might be longer. So this timeline might extend a little bit. It's just, yeah. Cause these are, there's a lot of rules and stuff to learn um, for this stuff. So, but we'll play it by ear. You know, we can always move things forward if we need to, but we're, we're doing really good. I mean, if you think about in totality of what we've already covered, I mean, yeah, we pretty much covered all the big components of the R language outside of, you know, the basics, but now we're starting to get into more pattern stuff and mm -hmm. more kind of higher level abstract stuff, which is really kind of neat. So, yeah. All right, cool. Well, um, I can hang out and chat a little bit more, but, um, you know, if people want to chat about some other stuff, uh, but other than that, like that's, that's all we have for this week. And then we'll talk about chapter 18 expressions next week. And then we'll go from there. Sounds good. See you guys next week. Yep. yep. See, See you next week. See ya. See ya.